Thanks, Jose. And thanks for everyone. This has been a great meeting. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I have the distinct honor and privilege of holding you all here for the last talk. So, uh, and it's been great to see all the other work that's been done. So everyone has set up a number of the things I'm, I'm going to talk about quite well. And it's actually really great to see Meredith's work because about five years ago, if I was at a meeting talking about coastal acidification, I would have gotten beat out of the room by the chemical oceanographer. So this field is changing and, and uh, very rapidly. And I think people are starting to recognize that issue. So uh, <clears throat> that's me. There's been a lot of people have contributed to this work. I won't go through all their names. Unfortunately, the Sea Grant logo wanted to be more important than NSF, apparently. Um, but there is my Twitter handle, email, and profile. And I encourage you guys to write me. I get a lot of kind of random emails from people, from industry folks, from just the general public. And if you have questions that you don't get answered here, feel free to contact me. Uh, I actually enjoy answering those sorts of emails. OK, so um, I'm a bit of a, I might, you might say I have scientific attention deficit disorder. So um, I sort of embrace my ecological training and kind of work across a, a broad span of different disciplines. So you heard from a true physiologist earlier today. You heard from a true biomechanics person. You heard from a true evolutionary biologist, ecologist. I'm not any of those things, but I, my work touches on a number of those factors. So it's the great work of people like that that helps provide the foundation to try to do this sort of synthesis. So I'm going to start uh, all good stories, sonnets. Uh, have three parts or three movements. So we're going to have three movements. Uh, basically, we're going to look at uh, kind of following on some of the work Meredith just talked about. These are early calcification stages. This is a uh, Olympia oyster larvae at that sort of pre-shell stage. I love this one because it looks like Pac-Man as that shell is engulfing. Um, then there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. I'm just going to totally ignore through the middle part of the life uh, all the really kind of interesting things. And then um, look at what happens after, after these animals die and what happens to those shells, and particularly oysters, why that's really important, the, the fate of those shells. And then uh, the sort of impact of CO2 on there. So we're going to have kind of three parts or three movements uh, of this story. So we're going to start with the CO2 story. So uh, it's been a long two days. I've been sitting in this dark room, it's been air conditioned. So just to sort of revitalize the group. Everyone take two deep breaths with me, okay, ready? <sighs> okay, one more, one more deep breath. <sighs> okay, so we've actually measured the CO2 in conference rooms like this uh, after several <laughs> hours. And we have, I didn't bring a sensor with me, but we actually have, and often, we, we are well above uh, 2100 CO2 levels just because of all this breathing. So I'd like to bring this back around because then people start to feel guilty, right? Now I feel everyone's starting to breathe more shallow, like, oh, I sh <laughs> shouldn't be breathing so much. I'm contributing to this problem. So there was a story a few years back in Seattle. There was a state lawmaker who was trying to push through this tax on bicycles. I don't know if, this, if you guys saw this. I think it may have hit the national news. But his argument was that bicycling is no good for the environment. Okay. So uh, he doesn't think bicycling is environmentally friendly because the activity causes cyclists to have an increased heart rate and respiration. We're breathing heavier. We're exhaling more CO2. The CO2 in our breath is about 100 times higher than what's in the atmosphere. So it seems very logical, right? We're going to breathe more, more CO2 in the environment. Um, so, you know, you'd be giving off more CO2. This is all quotes directly from him on the story. Rather than driving a car. So, okay, we can check that one. But, you know, as many politicians do, however, I haven't done any analysis of this. You know, this is just my logical argument about the difference of CO2 from a, a person on a bicycle compared to the engine of a car. Fortunately, many other people have, and that's very easily <laughs> fine on the Internet. So had he just used the Google, he could have actually verified that. And it turns out that, you know, if you travel a kilometer on a bike, I think it's about 16 grams of carbon that you emit. And if you drive a car, it's about 229. So it's a really big difference, right, between the CO2 emissions. Okay, gets better. Uh, so, but you know, sort of taking the task on this is, well, you just can't say there's no pollution as a result of riding a bicycle. Is that right? I mean, there's CO2, we are emitting CO2. So in the average human, sort of at resting, or over the course of a day, exhales about 6.6 .6 pounds of carbon in a day, just for us breathing. Okay, I feel everyone breathing more shallow again, feeling guilty, <laughs> right? It's very tense now. Okay, so let's, let's think about this so we can take the number of people, how much we breathe in a day, and multiply that by the number of days in a year. And we get a number that looks about 1.56 trillion pounds of carbon per year in our collective exhale. 
trillion pounds of carbon per year. Seems like a lot, doesn't it? Okay, so what do you think tailpipes? That's actually about 21 trillion pounds of carbon per year in the collective tailpipes. So it's about a 5% of the emissions from the tailpipes. Okay, so there's still an effect. Maybe it's not a very big effect, right? But it's still, a, it's still part of that CO2 emission. So should we feel guilty about breathing? <laughs> if we breathe less, is that going to help a few percent? Anybody know? So it's a mass balance. So I, I, I mentioned I kind of cover a lot of grounds. I have a lot of background in biogeochemistry, sort of understanding global cycles of things. And so the CO2 that we respire come from plants, right? So everyone can take a deep breath and not feel guilty about it. That CO2 that you're exhaling was in the atmosphere a couple years ago at most, okay? Plants took that CO2 out of the atmosphere. You eat that, you digest it, you respire it, you exhale it again. It's a very short cycle. So that's not contributing to that actual rise in CO2 emissions as we grow more plants that feed more people. It's sort of a mass balance. We take more CO2 out of the atmosphere, we put it into our body, and we exhale it again. So everyone take another deep breath. It's fine. Okay, good. Okay. So, and this is basically, you know, there's a bunch of equations and things that happen in here, but it's just a, it's a short cycle. When we burn fossil fuel, we have a much longer uh, time frame here, right? So we're taking carbon, we're taking organic carbon that has lots of energy. Organic carbon that has lots of energy, we eat that, we turn it into inorganic carbon. We're taking organic carbon that's taken millions of years to form out of the earth at rates of over about 100 years, right? So it's orders of magnitude faster than the planet can actually store that carbon again. So that is the fundamental problem. So don't feel bad about riding a bicycle, breathing more heavily, exercising. Those are all good things for you to do. It's not contributing to CO2 increases in the atmosphere, okay? Good. So that CO2 you're exhaling is only a few years old. CO2 in fossil fuels is millions of years old. All right. So that's an important distinction to think about and recognize why us being here breathing is okay. And we shouldn't feel bad about that. There's a lot of guilt that people have heap on us about all the number of things, and that's not something you should feel bad about. So I want to step back now. So now I'm going to pretend I'm a paleoceanographer or an evolutionary biologist or something like that for a little bit. So the Cretaceous Ocean was a, a really interesting period in the Earth's history, about 145 to 65 million years ago. This was the approximate arrangement of the continents around the, of the planet. Does anybody know why it's called the Cretaceous? It's all these. So I, I'll warn you that one of the reasons I'm not fully a biologist is because I'm really bad at memorizing Latin and Latin names. So I realized that chemistry and process and things are much, I'm much more interested in. But all the Latin speakers in the room, you know what Creta? Chalk. It's the chalk period of the ocean. So uh, something like 70% of the biogenic calcium carbonate, or 70% of the carbonate that we have on the planet was formed during this period of time on the Earth. Okay. So all this calcium carbonate was formed during this period of time, millions and millions of years ago. There's been some periods after that where there's, there's estimates of some formation of that. It was an interesting period of time. You'll see there's no polar snow, no ice. Uh, we had very high water, sea level rise. There's Florida, pre-Florida. Um, shallow inland seas, and so these really shallow areas is where a lot, we had a lot of these carbonate deposition events and this buildup of calcium carbonate on the planet but the PCO2 over four times higher than it is today. So we've heard all day, well, at least this afternoon and, and some this morning, about how high CO2 prevents calcification. So how can this be? Well, we're going to come back to this, and Meredith did a great job introducing this. This is a saturation state. And so she talked quite a bit about that. And there are the White Cliffs of Dover. That's one of those carbonate deposition events that occurred during this period of time, this old seafloor that's been uplifted through geologic processes. So, uh, a little another audience participation question now. Do they want to guess what, well, there's probably several people in here who know this. It's probably a bad audience. But what reef building organism evolved during this period was a dominant reef builder? Hmm? Somebody say corals? Corals. No, bivalves. Mollusks. OK, so these are uh, rudists. These are actually, this is a deposition. These are an old fossilized reef from Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was old seafloor that was uplifted. 
these are sort of the early, some of the earliest bivalves, um, or reforming bivalves that have been formed. They had lots of different shapes. But basically these grew as a sort of a bottom tube that the organism grew on top of and then a top flapper valve. So instead of having two valves this way, they grew up like a reef would and then had that top closure on, closure on it. So we have this period of time. We made all this calcium carbonate on the planet. We have these mollusks that are apparently imperiled by high CO2 that, that evolved and thrived and grew and were ubiquitous throughout the planet. How could that be? Is this really just all a farce? Well, the alkalinity of the ocean was about twice what it is today. Okay? So it's really interesting when you start to get into this and these, these sort of geologic changes over time. So the alkalinity is that buffering. It's that inorganic carbon that's in the water. And so what happens is when you have periods of naturally high CO2 that's often caused by volcanoes, and volcanoes are active, the continents are moving around quite a bit. As they move around, they get uplifted, and you have much more weathering. And so does anyone know why the sea is salty? Weathering, right? So, so what happens is that hydrologic cycle, that water, rain comes on the land, it washes little tiny bits of salts off the the, the land into the ocean and that those accumulate over time and develop into an equilibrium. So what happens is in these geologic times when you had really high CO2, that alkalinity was much higher because all those carbonate rocks were being weathered more readily. So bo both the CO2 being higher in the atmosphere would wash that stuff down into the ocean and then you had more uplift and so the continents were actually being worn down, bringing more salt into the ocean. Okay, and so that's where this thing of saturation state comes in that's really important. Um, so Meredith mentioned this, and you've heard a few times today about acidity. And then this is really important. The acidity is different than the corrosivity, okay? So this is one of these chemistry things. So acidity is that change in pH. The corrosivity is a saturation state. And so in a modern ocean and what we're doing now, those things are tightly coupled. But in a geologic past, they weren't always, okay? So you can think about this, the analogy I like to use, this should resonate well here. It doesn't do well in Oregon when I talk about sweet tea. One kind of scratches their head and they're like, sugar's really bad for you, you shouldn't. So sweet tea, right? How do you make sweet tea? You add a whole lot of sugar and you heat it up until it all dissolves, right? And what happens if you try to put more sugar in there? Can you dissolve it? No, it's super saturated with sugar. Same idea, the oceans are super saturated with calcium carbonate. And so what we do is, is we change that saturation state we can dissolve calcium carbonate. So these numbers were quite a bit higher. We had more alkalinity, more of that inorganic carbon, and that carbonate ion was in much greater quantities. And so the acidity might have been lower, but the corrosivity didn't change nearly as much in that geologic record over the time, as far as we can tell. OK, so what's different now and why it matters? So this is a really nice uh, it's got an Earth system model that was done. Actually, I had the pleasure of meeting Barbell Hunnish just recently at a meeting down in Australia a couple weeks ago. Um, but what they've done is taken some of the best sort of Earth models and model how the chemistry of the ocean would change with different doubling rates of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so the idea is how quickly do we double CO2 from pre-industrial to, to the future? And so do we do it in 10 years or we do it in 10,000 years? And what you're looking at is an acidity or a pH and the corrosivity on the y-axis. So when we double CO2 very quickly, you see those are very tightly correlated, right? So the corrosivity and the acidity both change together linearly, more or less. What happens is if you change it much more slowly, you'll see we do change the acidity, but the corrosivity doesn't change nearly as much. And if we change it even really slow, about 10,000, we actually get increases over time in that saturation state. So it's actually very favorable for making calcium carbonate at double the CO2 levels in the atmosphere if we just do that really slowly. Now, it doesn't address climate change. It doesn't address the thermal impacts and the other things. It's only addressing how that changes the chemistry of the ocean, okay? <clears throat> this is going to be important when we think about the mechanisms of why things are sensitive and how they're sensitive to uh, acidification. So uh, Meredith did a great job touching on this, coastal zones and estuaries. Um, have fresh water inputs. That changes alkalinity usually. So more fresh water lowers the salinity, lowers those dissolved salts, lowers that buffering capacity. In those systems, as you change CO2, the changes in the pH will be more rapid. So you have more buffering, the change in the pH changes more slowly. Okay? 
And then finally, uh, variables in the carbonate system, and so it's pH and saturation state, don't respond linearly to increasing CO2. And so this was from a paper we published uh, last year. And I'll show you the actual experimental data, but this was just a simulation. So again, we have saturation state and pH, and we <coughs> take 200 microatmospheres. Each of these dots is an increase in 100 microatmospheres of CO2, and this is how the chemistry changes. <coughs> and so what we know, the number of experimental studies that have been done over the years, that many bivalve larval experiments, we start to see chronic effects at about a saturation state of about two. Mer Meredith again mentioned this earlier. We don't have to be undersaturated or corrosive to see these sorts of problems. We start to see these acute effects below 1.5. And I put this 0.3 pH unit on here because that's been the sort of best estimate sort of in these meta-analyses for mollusks about how much the pH needs to change until we start seeing impacts on organisms. And so this sort of captures whether you think about things as an envelope that things are adapted to or whether there are actual absolute thresholds. And like many good questions in science, the answer to that is yes. Both of those are probably true. Okay. Um, so now let's think about how these things actually experience chemistry, right? So a lot of models and graphs of how that changed globally over time. So I like this. This is a great analogy. Um, this is not chemistry, but this is some work that Brian Helmuth has done. They had 10 years of uh, records. They had these things they called robo mussels. So they made these little mimics of mussels. They embedded temperature loggers inside them, put them out in the inner tidal, and just measured what they actually are exposed to, right? And so what you see, uh, so this is sort of in the Northwest. I think this is in Northern California. You'll see there are seasonal changes in, chemistry, in temperature, rather. These are running means, so three to six months or so running average. You see that there's you know, a wide range of conditions that are experienced from 16 down to about 12 or even 11 degrees C. What's interesting, if we take two years, 2005 and 2007 there, 2004 and 2007, and we look at, you look at those and the average conditions are kind of the same. There's about sort of averaging everything over that period of time. If we look at uh, something that might be more important to the organism, it's a number of days that temperature exceeded 30 degrees C. What we see is that there are more extreme events in 2007 than 2004. Okay? So this is the number of days over that season that the temperature went above 30, which is a kind of heat shock level for mussels. It's a stressful environment. It doesn't necessarily kill them, but it creates a stress on the organism. Um, and then these numbers here above these dots, so see almost a month above 30 versus, you know, about a week. And this is the number of days in between return events. So it's not just that you're seeing more events, but the frequency of those events are more common. And I think that was a lot of what, you know, a lot of the good work Mark is doing is showing that they can recover, but not if they're seeing those extreme events every year or two, right? You need many years in between. And that variability is natural. And so there have been extreme events in the past by a whole range of natural conditions. And so what we're doing is creating more extreme events. And I think Brian really summed this up perfectly is the way that I tend to think about this. While climate change is a global phenomenon to an organism, all relevant changes are very local, are very local as the organism moves through space and time. And that, I think, is a really ultimate challenge that we're kind of dealing with now to try to understand how acidification is affecting these organisms, especially in places like in Massachusetts uh, and in the Northwest where I've been working uh, more recently. Okay, so, uh, so a number of these are graphs I threw in here. I was sort of have the, the sort of fun thing about going last is you see what everyone else says and then you can kind of modify your talk. So this is, uh, this is I threw this in here just to sort of maybe try to help hit this point home a little bit more. Uh, these are one of these graphs that don't have axes. There's no units on here, right? So this is not a real data graph. This is a conceptualization of an idea that I was working on and try to think about how we think about these variable systems and how that affects the biology. And so what I have plotted here is a wavelength. This is on a log scale. Uh, well, not quite on a log scale, but it's a wavelength in hours. And uh, the magnitude, or the relative contribution to this thing that I like to call carbonate chemistry weather. Okay, So we think about climate change, but it's really weather that impacts organisms. right? And so we can sort of shift and use that same model to think about ocean acidification in that same way. So we have to understand the exposure histories of the organisms to the chemistry. And so we can think about carbonate weather in the same way. 
So these, you know, the graphs out in the open Pacific, which are great to show just that we're changing the global chemistry of the ocean, that has really very little relevance or bearing to most organisms. So the way to think about this is, uh, and you can disagree with this because this is not any data, I made this up in my head. Um, <laughs> essentially, these shorter term, higher frequency events create a greater perturbation in the system, right? So diurnal changes in things like tides, net community production, uh, different tidal regimes, storms, upwelling. These all change the chemistry in big ways. Um, but we can also plot on here the level of biological organization. So from things like calcification in those larval stages, which I'll talk more about later, out to populations, communities, and evolution. Those map in this time and space scale as well. And so when we have an exceptional, say, bloom in a system, the permanence of that effect on the entire system is somewhat temporary in transit, right? And if you accumulate lots of those over time, you start to see these effects. Uh, however, those longer term changes in the baseline, you don't have to change the system nearly as much, but you start to impact uh, potentially these bigger, larger scales of biological organization. And so essentially these baseline shifts change the frequency and magnitude, but any one of these diurnal events or events that occur on short time scales isn't what destroys an entire population necessarily. Now the corals are, you know, again, they there's some recovery, but as you see, if you start doing that more and more frequently, then it becomes really a big issue. And you're starting to move out into these areas, I think. So anyway, um, I just, I like that conceptualization to try to capture and think about across all these different scales of biological organization we've been talking about the last several days. Okay, so now I'm gonna move into the, um, I wasn't gonna talk too much about this, but I popped a couple of these in here too. Um, so it's a good thing I got an extra 15 minutes, so I'm gonna make sure I use all of my time before 30 and keep you here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so some of you may have seen this in the news. Uh, it's been a big issue. Uh, some of the uh, Washington Blue Ribbon Panel this, a lot of this was all spawned out of this Pacific Northwest Oyster Sea crisis. It got national coverage. Um, the, the sort of interesting thing is I served on that blue ribbon panel. I was the sole non-Washingtonian on the panel, and I spent the entire time reminding everyone that it was actually the work in the Oregon hatcheries that spawned all this work. And so Washington was like, we're so proud. And I'm like, you guys are good politically, but it was all the work that we started in the Oregon hatcheries, and then the Washington hatcheries followed from there. Um, and it's really interesting to see <clears throat> because now what's happened is that the production has been restored quite a bit and the hatcheries are not talking as much to each other anymore. But during this period, so this started uh, in the late, early to mid to late 2000s. Um, the started at the Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery in Etarts Bay, which is a, a small coastal bay, has very little freshwater influence in the summer, um, gets a full blunt of the ocean, large tidal range they started having these production failures. And they would see them occasionally in the past, but they started becoming more and more persistent over time. It was about 2006 and 2007, they started becoming strange. By 2008, they had full months where they could not produce one cohort of larvae that, would, that they would get out any commercial level of production out of. They were about ready to close the doors of the hatchery in 2008. And so the really interesting thing about the oyster industry in the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast in general, is there's really three commercial hatcheries that supply all the oyster growers. Two of those are vertically integrated, so they supply their own sort of operations first, and then they'll sell leftovers. The Oregon hatchery is the only one that supplies, well, it's supplied about 60 to 80% of the independent small oyster growers on the U.S. West Coast. So um, this is an interesting little side note. So um, Emily's work with Ian Jeffords up at Penco Shellfish. Um, he, is, he has been such an incredible advocate for research and monitoring to understand this problem. But when this started and the hatchery said, hey, Ian, we don't have seed to sell you. We're out of seed. Ian said, you're just being brainwashed by those academics. This is all a big hoax. <laughs> and he was really loud about accusing those guys. And eventually, to his credit, we, we showed the data to him. He got to see what was happening. And he came around and actually is now, they go to DC twice a year and pound on the doors of their representatives and say, this is an issue that needs to be addressed federally. So uh, it has spawned a lot of really great work. The oyster hatchery and knee tarts now and, and tailors as well. They get people from all over the country, all over the world actually come there to ask them what they're doing. So the way we dealt with this is uh, my colleague Burke Hales, who's a, a real, not like me, a fake carbonate chemist, but a real carbonate chemist, 
he, uh, they put instrumentation in the hatchery that let them see, and they were able to observe, and I'll show you that data in a minute, that when the CO2 was high, the larvae did really bad. When the CO2 was low, they did okay. And that was just a very simple sort of step, but just monitoring that chemistry allowed them to see how they could take advantage of those, those cycles. And so throughout the day, what they could do, what they realized was they could, what they normally do is come in in the morning, drain their tanks, catch the larvae, fill up the tanks again. And what would happen is they're basically exposing the larvae to the worst possible chemistry because all night, all the respiration in the system has built up that CO2. Simply by shifting when they fill the tanks in the evening, that restored about 60 to 70% of the production that they had lost in the previous years. Following that, they said, we don't really like working overnight. So it's actually a small operation. There's only a handful of people there. So we helped them set up a buffering system. And so we called the Tums approach. And so all we're doing now is putting antacid into the water, all their culture water, and that's gotten them up to about 80% plus now. Um, and so that has restored a lot of that production. The hatchery in Washington is now doing the same. I, I believe Bill's hatchery is doing some of that. There's uh, setting operations all up and down the coast where the growers are now buffering their water as well. So it's been a, a, been a huge step forward. And you talk about sort of messaging and getting people engaged. Those industry folks have been a credible proponent for pushing forward the political momentum to try to get people aware of this issue. Um, so, okay, that's all I want to say about that. Um, so, so this is a system. Uh, Meredith mentioned upwelling. So we have this really incredible system in the Pacific Northwest. In the summertime, the winds come around out of the north. Because of the physics of the system, it pulls up this deep, old, cold water. It hasn't touched the atmosphere in a long time. It's been deep. It's picked up a lot of nutrients. And it fuels an incredibly productive fishery. So we have incredibly productive salmon fisheries, Dungeness crab, pink shrimp, some really productive and sustainable fisheries. Um, but one of the consequences of all that old water is it picks up a lot of metabolic CO2 as well. And so this was some work uh, on, a, on a spot called NH10, Newport Hydro, Hydrologic, Hydrographic Line, 10 miles offshore. Uh, my colleague Burke Hales uh, was involved with. So he spent one summer out there taking measurements of saturation state. And, we, and then because of the simple thermodynamics of the system, what we can actually do is subtract off. We know how much anthropogenic carbon has come in to the system. So we can subtract that and see how the chemistry has changed from that increase in, in atmospheric CO2. And so this is the, the contemporary values. So you see our average kind of median value is just around 2, 2.5 or, so, or 2.2 saturation state, so fairly well. And we see that we have corrosive conditions, though, also. So we do have observations and times when that surface water is actually corrosive to calcium carbonate. If we take out that anthropogenic carbon, we see that median value has moved up to about 2.7. And we would, in theory, never really see corrosive water. And so it may not seem like a lot of CO2 when you look at 280 to 400, but here we're starting to push the system to these thresholds uh, very quickly. Uh, this is some additional work in the system here. This is a really nice um, ecosystem model. So what it tries to do is capture the physics and the sort of very fundamental basic chemistry and biology. And so what this is uh, forecasting the saturation state in the surface water. Um, this is the pre-industrial envelope for that model. This is where we are today. And what you'll see is very quickly we move outside of that envelope. So we're the, what used to be low saturation state in this water offshore here is now the new high in the next decade or so. So and these are values again, as Meredith noted, uh, 2100 in the global ocean. So these coastal systems can often be these hot spots uh, because they already have higher CO2 and that accumulation of excess anthropogenic carbon pushes them very quickly past that system, those thresholds. Okay, so uh, part of that larval sea crisis is there, was a, there are naturalized populations of oysters in Willow Bay. Um, they're not native to the, to the system. Um, and so this is some work, again, my colleague Burke Hales, and I worked on this with him. They did several years of monitoring data at a spot in the bay that's sort of the probably best possible conditions for growing oysters. Um, and again, the same sort of approach. And we know that the, one of the real problems for oysters in that bay is it's not, rarely ever warm enough. And so there's a brief window usually where it's warm enough for the oysters to reproduce. And then so we want to take a look at is how does that thermal window overlap with the optimal saturation state window. And so we'll see in 2012, so this is the pre-industrial optimum. You see that we have a large window of time from May almost all the way out to November where without the anthropogenic carbon, it's all fine. So it's really the thermal window that um, limits that 
uh, reproduction. With the current day conditions, you see that there's a very small window, only a couple weeks, where those two things overlap and those conditions are adequate for the larvae to develop normally. 2013 was a little bit better, but again, uh, larger thermal window, there's a larger overlap here. And then surprisingly, 2014, it just didn't matter at all. And so this is some of the complexities of trying to understand this in terms of what the organisms experience, is that there's some years, no matter what, even, even with or without that anthropogenic carbon, it's just not good. And this is a salinity event, basically, in 2014 that drove down that saturation state. So regardless of the CO2, it wouldn't have made a difference. Um, and so in theory, we would always see these things in the natural system. And what we're doing is we're creating conditions where you have fewer and fewer opportunities for these little thresholds and these critical points in life history where it's really important. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to show you this. This is uh, some of the background from the hatchery. So these are, this was a really interesting paper. It's gathered a lot of attention. Uh, it's gotten a lot of criticism over it because these aren't actual experiments we did. So these are actually production records from the hatcheries that we've compiled and put together. And so I have a few graphs here. Uh, the first graph is going to show you kind of initial survival, then early growth, mid growth, and total production. These growth periods are based on the number of days that they have to stay in a certain tank or they reach a certain size. So they use sieves and they see how many that they catch. And that's how they measure growth. And then there's a total production value at the end here. And then the, the value I'm showing you here is the saturation state in the initial water. And that's basically the first 48 hours when they spawn the larvae. And then uh, and nothing else. So that's only accounting for that first 48 hours. And so you see that, you know, this is not significant. There looks like maybe a little trend. Here's that sort of period in time. Uh, Meredith covered a bunch of this before, different shell stages. We see with the early growth, there's almost no relationship at all. Mid-growth, we start to see some effects. So this is usually about um, one to two weeks in at this point. And we really see the relationship is where they make the money is this total production. And so what's really surprising is that 53% of the production that comes out of that hatchery can be predicted by what those oyster larvae see in the first 48 hours. Doesn't matter what happened the rest of the time for the next two weeks, that first 48 hours set the stage entirely for how much money they were making. And this was maddening to them because they'd often not see these problems in the first week or so. What they would actually see is the larvae would just sort of drop to the bottom and hang out, they'd be alive, viable, they're feeding. But they just basically, what we've, we've now known and measured is they essentially get so low in energy that they never really recover. Okay. So this is what gave us the scientific proof, at least, to be able to say this is really a problem for the oyster industry out here. Okay, so uh, that's going to lead us to Act 2 of our sonnet or uh, play. Uh, so birth of seashells. And so um, we've been working on this, this question of sort of mechanisms of sensitivity of these bivalves for um, uh, about six, seven years now. And um, so I'm going to show you some experimental work we've done here. Um, Meredith covered this quite a bit. It's very similar for oysters. And for this uh, part of the study I'm going to talk about right here, I don't have the we didn't break them up as finely as Meredith's study, so we looked just at the first 48 hours for these things. We're going to get to this towards the end of the talk. So why are they so sensitive at this early life history stage? Um, I published a paper about three years ago on this, and um, really it comes down to, essentially this is a 10-hour-old uh, Pacific oyster embryo at 14 hours and 16 hours. And so you kind of saw this, but what I really like about these examples is this is that periostracum or that outer coating of the shell that first organic material, you see how it's kind of wrinkly and loose. By four hours in, you start to see how it's starting to get taut and pulled tight. And then by 16 hours, it's a completely fully calcified shell. Um, and it's just fascinating to think about what's going on in here. And what this turns out, if you take, just look at the bulk biochemistry of these organisms. This, th this stage, there is zero calcium carbonate in their body. By weight, at this point, they're 80 to 90 percent calcium carbonate by weight. Let me say that again. It would be like if you had no bones in your body, <laughs> and six hours later you were fully skeletalized. It's, it's the single most significant calcification event in this organism's life occurs here. And at this size, these are not much bigger than the diameter of your hair at this point. That's how small they are. 
So it's a really small total amount of, of calcium carbonate, but it's a tremendous amount of calcification that occurs. So it's very rapid calcification. That's why we think they're so sensitive. I've saved all you guys from all the chemistry data we have on this and the stabilized stoke data, but what we, what we think we understand is they have very rudimentary control on the calcification. Once they get past this stage, they can actually control that calcification surface far better. It's not as exposed to the environment. And they're just basically running on the energy that they have available to them at this point. And so that, that sort of egg energy is so critical. Um, to give you another sort of view of these abnormalities, so Meredith and I were talking yesterday a little bit, and it's really interesting. We didn't see nearly as many of those kind of um, indentations in the, in the hinge in the Pacific oysters, but we do see a lot of this sort of abnormality, where this is actually in the Prodisaconch 2 stage, where the shell just simply can't form. And we know that these, most of these will never recover when they're, when they're um, in that state. So now I'm going to show you, I'll give you the take home before we get lost in the graphs and the data. But the larvae are most sensitive to saturation state, not pH or CO2. And this has been another one of these battles I've been fighting with other people in the, in the field because most of our understanding of the physiology is it's affected by the pH. And I don't have the data here, but we, can, we actually have that as well. We, we have experiments where we see changes in respiration rate from pH, but all these effects are actually due to saturation state. Okay, how do we know that? So uh, this is a complicated slide, a complicated few graphs. The way we design these experiments is we can essentially manipulate the carbonate chemistry in ways that everyone has said you're not supposed to in any ocean acidification experiment for years. So another one of these things that we went against what everyone said you're supposed to do. But what we're able to do is you change the amount of inorganic carbon, that alkalinity, right? So everyone runs their, their experiments at one salinity or alkalinity and they add CO2 and everything co-varies and you can't separate it. And there was a long debate amongst the chemical oceanographers and the physiologists which variables more important. There were very elaborate arguments that were built up and made. And we said, why don't we just manipulate the chemistry and let the organism tell us what, what's most important. So these are CO2 values here on the y-axis and this is saturation state. And these lines are actually lines of equal um, pH. Okay? So what we can do is we can separate essentially CO2 from saturation state and we can do the opposite as well. So we can have a saturation state that's undersaturated from very low CO2 to very high CO2, or we can have a saturation state that's high at higher CO2, or we can have a low CO2 across a range of saturation state. And then what we have, because we did, we essentially have 16 treatments, and these are brutal experiments. I've tortured many graduate students through these, uh, and there's even worse ones I'll show you after this. But we have some values that fall along these lines as well, and so we can also use that to kind of pseudo-independently evaluate pH. Okay, so these are all short-term exposures, so we're not looking at those kind of carryover effects. We're only looking at sort of impacts in the PD-1 stage, and we haven't separated that pre- and post-calcification either that Meredith noted. Okay, so, um, so we're going to look at Pacific oyster larvae first. And so on the y-axis here, on all these graphs, I have the proportion normal larvae. So we did these under light microscope. We looked for a normally formed shell 48 hours after fertilization. And what you'll see is that at really high CO2s, we can get plenty of good, happy, healthy looking larvae. Um, pH, we see a similar effect. Because we don't have a complete orthogonal design with pH, we, it's hard to separate this entirely. But we get down to 7.4, and these lighter numbers or a higher saturation state, we can get perfectly developed normal larvae out of that. And where we really see the effect then is at this stage here or this uh, saturation state number. You see a very tight relationship there. So these are just the number that develop normally. Now what we also did was look at shell length, but we only looked at the shell length in the ones that developed normally because the abnormal ones are going to have a bias to being smaller anyway. So the ones that did develop normally, we see the same effect. So all the way out to 2,000 microatmospheres of CO2, remember at 400 today, as long as the saturation state is high, we can get big, happy, healthy larvae. So it's really sort of interesting, and it really speaks to, I think, in some ways, the geologic changes that are happening now versus what's happened in the past because of the buffering system of the ocean, right? When CO2 changes in the past, we typically don't change the saturation state nearly as much. Okay, so now I want to compare these. These were Pacific oysters. These are um, sort of the workhorse of the oyster industry all around the world. Um, they're non-native, 
for the Pacific Northwest. And I don't, I did, left out the muscle work we've done, but we've also evaluated this relative to native and non-native mussels and see a very exactly same response as we do with the Pacific oysters. And so here is just capturing that proportion normal effect. Okay, so anyone want to guess what happens with the Olympia oyster? Participation again. It's either a yes or no. Is it an effect or no? Nobody wants to guess. It's not being graded. No, no is right. So <laughs> no effect. So what's really interesting about these Olympia oyster, and these are Austria, Lurida, different genus, they actually brood the young. Okay, and so it's really fascinating because what happens is, is through that brooding process, the development time is much slower. And so it takes much longer for them to grow and reach these same developmental stages. So one of the things, first things we had to do was figure out if we could grow these outside the brood chamber. They have to go through the oviduct for fertilization. It takes off a coating on the, on the egg. We can't um, strip spawn in the way we can with the Pacific oysters. We had a grad student who tried this, and he could get fertilized eggs out of these Austria that were pre-calcified and, and rear them all the way up to settlement, and they did just as well as the brooded larvae, which in itself was really fascinating because there's no physiological apparent benefit of being in that brood chamber, which opens up a whole bunch of other questions. But that was the first hurdle we had to get through. So then we could do that, and then we did the same exposure over the same period. So it's a five-day exposure versus a two-day exposure. And we see even, um, again, two experiments. So we repeated this, and we did the same with the Pacific, so two different experiments. We almost, it almost looks like they do worse in these higher saturation states and no effect on shell length. Okay, so uh, just to show this quickly, here are the SEMs over the same time period. So it's about 24 hours versus six hours. The differences in that timing of development. This was the really brutal one on the students. So for five days, every three hours, somebody had to take a sample as these things were developing and we measured the cal calcium concentration in those larvae. We counted how many larvae we had so we can actually get a per larvae that we further corrected to the size of the larvae calcification rate. Okay, and so the Pacific oysters are here, and so these are nanomoles of calcium per shell area over time. And what you'll notice is it's about a seven to eight fold difference in that rate of calcium accumulation or calcification in these species. Um, so they grow far more slowly. I like to call this the slow shell movement. You guys heard of the slow food movement? So the slow shell movement may help these organisms in some way. And I, this is really an interesting concept we, we dug up and we're, this paper is in press right now. But uh, we talk a lot about adaptation and whether things can adapt to changing environment. This might be an example of exaptation. So slow shell development didn't develop to help it deal with high CO2. That was, it was a whole suite of other things likely that caused that. And so exaptation is the idea that Organisms possess traits that will provide fitness that they weren't originally evolved for. And so instead of having to have genetic variation and selection, there might be traits that organisms have that allow it to survive in conditions that it hadn't evolved for that in the first place. So the classic example of this, if you remember back to biology, is feathers on birds, right? Feathers were evolved for thermal regulation in dinosaurs. Ultimately, they were used for flight, but they weren't evolved initially for flight. So we argue that it's a case of this. It may not be, but I think it's an interesting idea. I mentioned the energy question, so we wanted to pin that down as well. Um, this is a ratio of sort of uh, what we call uh, nonpolar lipids, which are basically like energy lipids, versus sterols, which are associated with cell membranes. So it gives us an idea of relative energy content. And so here's the Pacific oyster larvae over that same calcification period. That's uh, 0.38 per hour a change in that ratio. So it's a 40% drop in, per hour in that energy lipid, in that ratio of how much energy lipid versus structural lipid. And we see in the Olympia oysters there's almost no change over that period. So they're not using much energy as well. Okay, okay so now on to act three um, and the seashells. So this is some work I've been sort of piecing together over the years. We just got some money from NOAA last year to do some work in Chesapeake Bay to look at shells and the degradation rates of shells and how they contribute to the changes in chemistry in the environment. Um, I think this is probably the thing I thought most of you would be most interested in. I sort of developed this love of shells a long time ago and it's really fun to now go back into doing the science of how these things change. 
This is a fossilized shell we use in experiments. This is from Chesapeake Bay. Um, those are about 500 to 1,000 years old. They come up in the dredges and they outplant them again to use for habitat restoration. And there's some really interesting changes that occur in that process. So, um, so when oysters die, they leave their shells behind, right? And that's sort of a large part of the, the museum here. Um, what's really interesting is that when we go back and we look at records and estimates, that at some point pre-exploitation, uh, most of the world's tempered estuaries, those shells accumulated and far, formed large reefs. And so in almost every tempered estuary around the globe is filled with oyster reefs in one way or another. They were a critical, massive, uh, important component of those estuaries. And we completely sort of forget about that because we don't experience that today. Right? It's that shifting baseline is that we don't know, we lose that lack of perception of how, mu how big and extensive they used to be. And this is the argument that some have made why they're functionally extinct. So there's still plenty of oysters around, but relative to the impact that these things used to have on the environment and how they change the environment, they just don't do it anymore because they're just a fraction of what they once were. So this is just a picture of an oyster reef and a, a seagull taking advantage of that. So uh, Emily talked about ecosystem services as well as Mark, so I wanted to hit on a few here. This is now the third time you've seen something like this. <laughs> We can all agree that bivalves are important filter feeders. They clean the water. In places like Chesapeake Bay, anyway, that has massive implications for seagrass. So one of the big impediments to seagrass is coming back in Chesapeake Bay, other than temperature change, has been water clarity. And because those oysters used to filter massive amounts of water, the water used to be much clearer, more light penetrates to the bottom. It gives the seagrasses more opportunity to grow. There's these estimates that um, Roger Newell's made Many of you may have heard this. The pre-colonial estimates of populations of oysters in Chesapeake Bay would turn over and filter the entire volume of the bay in three days. In three days, the population of oysters would filter the entire volume of the bay. And now at the current population levels, it takes about 300 days to do that. Um, they're about 100-fold lower in population than they once were. Um, this is so, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting things about oysters. Um, because they're not the most charismatic shell makers, I'll admit. But I really appreciate them because I think they're very elegant in what they do. They're so, um, they're, their function is incredible. There's been uh, some anthropological work that suggests that part of the evolution of human brains was, co was evo evolved and was developed because of the consumption of shellfish. There are plenty of anthropologists who would disagree with that, but I really think that's cool. So there are some that think that that's true. So, so as the humans migrated out of Africa, um, and across uh, the Beringia land strait into North America. It, it wasn't until very recently, actually, it was, very, it was thought that most of that population went inland and became bison hunters. But in the last 20 years, they found evidence of caves along the Oregon coast where there was actually shell middens that were, that were sort of prehistoric humans, and they were actually surviving off much of the shellfish. Um, and so there's, and the, the great thing, if you don't like eating oysters, is they're really rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And so that's part of the idea is that the fatty acid composition was so optimal to help match what we have in our brains. Um, what else? Uh, flood control. So these are some archaeological drawings from New York Harbor. The idea is that we restore oyster reefs. That will help buffer floods. Um, nitrogen cycling. So we mentioned biodeposits before, but one of the things that that does is it creates an environment that actually lets the bacteria that take nitrogen that's available make it unavailable. So they can convert basically fertilizer into nitrogen gas and remove it from the system. And that's a large part due to the concentration of that organic matter and changing those microbial pathways. And then, uh, oh, I missed this one up here. There's been some estimates of about an extra five pounds of fish production per meter squared of oyster reef. Uh, I think that was in North Carolina. And then the other really, in talking about calcification, is that they actually generate calcium carbonate at much higher levels than uh, coral reefs. Sorry, Mark, I'm not... I pick on I pick on I do pick on corals a bit because I think oysters are very underappreciated. They're aesthetically not very you know this is not very lively looking right. It's hard to get behind that. So why corals? Why not us? Don't judge a book by its cover. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, in the um, early colonial days, as the the Europeans sailed up Chesapeake Bay here. Shells were actually shipping houses. There were numerous, numerous accounts of ships getting stranded on these oyster reefs. This is an estimate of 
all the um, pre-harvest, pre-colonial reefs. And so you see all along the fringing edges of Chesapeake Bay outside the main channel, all these black areas were estimated where there were oyster reefs once were. And there's a, it's, it's a, it, you wouldn't even see it if you mapped it out now. There's major um, work right now in the Choptank River. And they have the, one of the biggest restoration projects. Uh, it's about 40 acres of, of reef that has been now restored. And that's hopeful that's coming back. Um, but these, these reefs once covered 193 square miles of bay bottom. And the largest estimated reef was estimated at 28 square miles, which I estimate is 10 miles larger than Sanibel Island, 10 square miles larger than the island itself. So imagine one oyster reef that's 30% larger than Sanibel Island, one contiguous oyster reef. It just, again, we fail to appreciate how extensive and important these things were in these environments. And basically, <clears throat> they were great food. People loved to eat them. They were easy to get. And so these are old pictures of shell piles from oyster uh, shucking houses in Chesapeake Bay. And so massive amounts of shells were extracted from the bay and essentially never returned. And we'll talk, that's one of the aspects of this that I think is really interesting. So I wrestled with whether or not to put this in here. Um, I've tortured you with a bunch of chemistry already, so I'll just try to step through this quickly. But one of the really interesting aspects of an oyster reef versus a coral reef is that oysters are heterotrophic. And so they filter feed, they create all these biodeposits. And what that happens is a lot of those biodeposits end up in that reef scaffolding, right? So they're taking this organically rich material, really good substrate for bacteria, and putting that next to all this calcium carbonate. And they make these reefs in environments that are typically not as favorable for making calcium carbonate too, low salinity estuaries. And so one of the things we've been working on is trying to understand how these different processes, the biodeposit generation, that interaction with the calcium carbonate, affects how much alkalinity is recycled again. So every time they make a shell, taking alkalinity out of the water, so it's actually making the water worse for themselves, but if they're living in this environment where there's a bunch of dead shells and they're making all this biodeposit, that might be helping to regenerate some of that alkalinity and creating localized environments that are actually better. Or when the conditions in the overlying water get bad, it might act as a buffer system, basically. The same way that the hatcheries are now buffering their water, it could be a built-in internal one. If you're really into biogeochemistry, I can talk all about all these other geochemical processes that happen that are actually, uh, they're actually promoted by the fact of the low oxygen when you get into the reef core. Um, but I'll save you guys a lot of that headache and aggravation. So we don't really understand the balance of these processes yet. There's been very few studies that actually try to measure the alkalinity fluxes and exchanges in the system, and we're just starting to do some of this work now. And I don't have the picture up here, but I've done some work with medical CAT scanning in sediment cores. And it's a great way to look at shell material that's buried and without having to remove it. And so one of the things we're going to do is actually take cores of the reefs and do medical CAT scan to do material budgets down the core and look at how much water, how much sediment, how much organic material, and how much shell is there. Okay, so I mentioned this uh, harvest of shells over time. This was some work I put together. Um, somebody from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources had contacted me uh, after seeing a talk I had get, given and said, you know, we have all this data on the shell planting. Would you want to do anything with that? And I said, absolutely. So, so I'm going to show you a graph here. This is, uh, on this axis, is kind of the, this is the oyster shell, either removal or addition per year. And then on this side, I have a running tally or a budget, okay? So all we're doing is we're taking shell out and then we're gonna start putting shell back in. So we have the running budget will be in black. There's a harvest in red. And there's a dredge replace, which was sort of one of the largest shell replacement programs, I think, in the world ever enacted. And then there was an effort to replace fresh shells, which feels really nice, but you'll see why it's very ineffectual. So, so here we are, we're taking 10 million bushels of oysters out in early colonial time. Uh, harvest starts to slow down. Around this time, diseases start to kick in as well. And now we're at these sort of levels of uh, barely sort of fractions of what the harvest once was. You'll see that this running tally decreased over time. In about 1959 is when they started the dredge replacement program. So as they were dredging the harbors around in the, the, the uh, navigation channels in Chesapeake Bay, they're actually washing out the shell that was buried from these prehistoric uh, fossilized reefs and putting them back on and using them to replace that shell budget. Um, and so you see that actually made a fairly significant dent in that absolute shell budget, if you think about it. So, but ultimately, from what we've taken out, 
in terms of live shell. So this isn't catching all the dead shell that comes out with the dredge, so this is probably an underestimate. We're still about 100 million bushels behind in the shell balance in Chesapeake Bay from what it was in the pre-colonial, pre pre-exploitation time. Um, and then we have the fresh, so this was one of these taking shells from the restaurants and putting them back in, and you can see it's something that's good to do. It probably has really good localized effects, but it's not really making a dent in that shell budget. Uh, I'm going to skip over this and just get into the, um, so we did some experimental work a little while back on in looking at shell dissolution rates, which is something that there was very little information on for oyster shells. Um, and so this was just an undergrad project that turned out to, to really work out really well. Um, so what we're going to show, I'm going to show you some data. We looked at three different shell types and then we measured how the dissolution rates change with different CO2 levels, basically. And so we had three shell types. So we had fresh shells. So these were shells that I took the undergrad out and we ate raw oysters at the restaurant and then said, can we take those with us? Um, so they're as fresh as you can get. We had these weathered shells, which came from shells that I had eaten previously and I left in a pile outside my house. So this actually represents about two years of weathering outside, which is what they often do with the shells that they collect before they go back out on, the, on some of the fresh shell. And then this was fossil shell that we got from a shell pile at a marina that was working with the DNR that were actually holding a lot of these dredge shells that would go back out into the environment. Okay, so I have dissolution rate as percent per day on the y-axis here. The fresh ones are here. And then this is an estimate of half-life, basically. So it's how long it would take for half of that shell to dissolve, okay? And so we start up here. Uh, these are the actual saturation state levels and then pH is here. And what you'll see is almost a linear, I'm not really sure what happened here, but almost a linear increase in the dissolution rate over time. What you should notice too is that on those fresh shells, it has a half-life of about two years. So in theory, half of that shell dissolves at fairly saturated conditions. Um, so very quickly it dissolves on these are lower salinity waters. The thing to keep in mind in, these, in this environment, so we've talked about the periostricum, there's a whole bunch of organic matter that's in these shells as well. And so you get biofilms that form over these things that actually, I think, generate some of that dissolution. So they're actually, they're just feeding on the organic matter. And what that's doing is generating metabolic carbon that's then dissolving the shell. Uh, the weathered shell looks something like this, so a little bit slower. And then finally, the dredge shell, we see very low um, dissolution rates on the order of almost 40 years on those high pH values. After we published this, I got a call from a company that actually does dredging, I think up here in the Florida Panhandle, and they've been bringing shells up to Maryland because they've run out of shells in Chesapeake Bay. They don't find them anymore in the dredges up there. It's part of the replacement. And he was thrilled to see this. They were so happy because they thought those shells are going to last much longer on the reef. And I said, well, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, right, if they can't dissolve. So why are they dissolving at different rates? They're all the same material, right? They're all calcium carbonate. They're all calcite. I gave a little bit of a hint. So we looked at um, chemistry. So we used some, some techniques to look at the surface chemistry of the shells and also scanning electron micrographs, and so really high-resolution microscopy. So the first thing I'll show you here is these, this is strontium, magnesium, iron, and silicate. And what you'll notice is that in the dredge shell, we have these higher amounts of these impurities. So calcify exclude these, these trace elements. We want to keep them out of their shells. Their impurities, they mean that the calcium, the, the calcium carbonate is less pure. Um, and what we see is we look at, this is the dredge shell here. And what we actually see is what happens is it forms a, a skin on it. After it's buried, there's all this metabolic carbon in the sediments. That starts to dissolve, and then it re-precipitates as a different type of mineral on it. It's still calcite, but it actually creates a coating on the outside that prevents it from dissolving as fast. Uh, you'll notice the, the um, weather shell, and then in here you can actually see, if you really zoom in on this, you can see the periostricum on these layers as the oyster shell is deposited. So this is my last slide. Um, so I took that shell dissolution data. We have calcification data from, from oysters, from juvenile oysters. And what we don't yet know is whether or not oyster reefs will be able to maintain a net positive or neutral carbonate balance, right? If those reefs are going to persist, if we leave them alone, they need to be at least able to maintain a neutral carbonate balance. So the dissolution rate has to be matched by a calcification rate. And what's interesting when you look at this is we see that kind of linear response to the saturation state 
Again, there's always some disillusion, and these were individual shells, so this might be quite a bit different in that environment when we put all the pieces together. And we see that calcification rate, they're still able to net positively calcify at undersaturation, but it goes down very quickly as we cross that threshold, that, that saturation state of one. So, in closing, I hate to say conclusions because that means we're done with the question, but I think we have lots of questions to go. So we're changing the ocean in very rapid and significant ways. I think a number of people showed that. Those rates of CO2 change in the ocean are faster than it's happened in the last million years by direct measurement of gas bubbles and ice cores. If you use proxy data, it's maybe 50 million years we're changing the chemistry faster than has happened in the past. We don't fully understand the extent of the impacts from this rapid change, but they're real and they're happening today. So this isn't a far off problem. These are things that we're seeing today that are real. Um, and I've talked only about ocean acidification, and there's plenty of other human-based impacts. And uh, Mark noted that there's lots of other things we can do in the coastal zone to sort of offset some of these issues. And then what it comes down to is we have to realize there's a value judgment between fossil fuel and ocean health. And I think it's really hard for us to have these conversations. And Emily noted how we tend to really waffle as scientists. We never want to make a, a really direct stance. But I can tell you when I was on that blue ribbon panel, the politicians didn't want to make us, they didn't want to say anything very strong, right? They wanted the scientists to be the ones to say, this is what we should do. And the best that we can do as scientists is give that information to the policymakers or the public, bring that information to the policymakers and say, you need to do something about it. So it's not my place to judge whether or not we should continue our fossil fuel economy in, with the trade-off of ocean health or not. That's a value judgment for all of you to make, and it's a re responsibility, I would say, for all of us to take accounting for. So, and that's it. Thanks.